Patrick Henry finally leaves the Virginia House of Delegates in 1791 and says he won't be reelected again. Uh, it's not because he's unpopular. Uh, he continues to be one of the most popular politicians in Virginia, but he's decided he's at an age and at a point in his life where he needs to provide for his family and his children. I've mentioned that he continues to be raising a large family with his second wife, Dorothea. He has children born in 1790, 1792, 1794, 1796, 1798. 17 children in all when done, 11 with Dorothea. When he dies in 1799, 11 of his children are still alive. Now that's a very large number by 18th century standards. Uh, he thought 12 were alive. His daughter Annie, who uh, he loved dearly, died shortly before he does, and they, they wouldn't tell Henry because he was very ill, uh, essentially on his deathbed. Now, when he enters uh, retirement, initially he's living at Pleasant Grove in Prince Edward County. It's a 1,700-acre plantation. Uh, Henry always loves his role as a plantation owner and a farmer. In 1792, he moves to Long Island in Campbell County, eventually over 3,500 acres there. In 1794, he moves to Red Hill in Charlotte County. It's a 700-acre plantation. It's on the Roanoke River. While he's there, he's adding territory. He's adding land, expanding to almost 3,000 acres by his death. Uh, he refers to Red Hill as the garden spot of Virginia. Uh, by the time Henry dies, uh, he has almost 50,000 acres of land. He's living happily as a man, uh, plantation manager. Uh, one son-in-law says, I am positive I never saw him in a passion, nor apparently out of temper. Circumstances which would have highly irritated other men had no visible effect on him. So Patrick Henry's enjoying his retirement. Uh, in this period, his love for fiddling and playing flute for music and poetry is renewed. Uh, it's said that he often writes little short poems or little short songs for his young children and grandchildren. He has many grandchildren already. Uh, for his children and grandchildren, he's often found wrestling on the ground at Red Hill with his children and grandchildren. Uh, he, um, however, is conscious that maybe the great Patrick Henry uh, might be thought less of in writing these little ditties. And so when he's done singing these songs or playing these tunes for his children and grandchildren, he'll roll them up and throw them in the fire. So we don't have any of them preserved. He burns them, saying that he's afraid it will injure his reputation. Patrick Henry is also uh, engaged with many sons and grandsons in their formal education, sending many of them to Hampton Sydney College. This is an era where, unfortunately, his daughters and granddaughters are not going uh, for that kind of a formal education. Um, he is very interested in seeing to it that they get the formal education, which he did not, even though, as we discussed, his, his education was excellent. He prizes the ability to send his children and grandchildren to Hampton Sydney College. One of his grandchildren reports that he would check up on their work, and in particular, he would check on their Latin, and they far more feared Henry's review of their Latin work than their Latin professor. Um, Henry is also continuing to maintain his legal office at Red Hill. And if you go visit Red Hill today, the legal office that Henry used in the 1790s is still standing there uh, pretty much as it was. Uh, he taught several of his sons and his grandsons law in that law office. Remember in the 18th century, the primary way to learn law is as an apprentice under a young lawyer, uh, or under a lawyer, Henry's no longer young. Uh, Henry had read the law, he had pursued a different course, but he's very happy to have the chance to teach some of his um, progeny the law. He also continues to practice some law himself. Um, in this period, in addition to playing with his children and grandchildren and practicing law, being concerned about education. He becomes a great land speculator. He obviously loves land. Uh, he's talking in this period about if the federal government does become too powerful and dangerous, he wants to be able to escape to some of his western lands. And, and so this is one of the reasons he's buying uh, lands, as well as having plantations for each one of his sons when he dies. One of his acquaintances says, as for boasting, he was an entire stranger to it unless it be that in his latter days he seemed proud of the goodness of his lands. As I mentioned, when Patrick Henry dies, he has almost 50,000 acres of land, uh, which he's going to bequest to his children. Now, we might pause on one particular land deal that fell through. Uh, it doesn't 
doesn't happen, but it's been wrongly used to cast aspersions on Patrick Henry's integrity, both in various histories as well as at the time. Thomas Jefferson, again, uh, being one of the culprits. A very complicated land transaction. We don't need to understand all of its details, but Georgia, which still owned the ter territory that we know of as Alabama and Mississippi, was selling off some of the lands in the far west. Uh, now, by the way, there were serious questions as to whether Georgia or the Native Americans owned those lands, but Georgia sells um, a very large tract of what's referred to as the y Yazoo lands uh, on the Mississippi and the Yazoo River to a consortium of buyers in which Patrick Henry is a member. So Patrick Henry has joined with a number of other people to buy these very speculative lands out on the Mississippi uh, in what is now Mississippi. Well, that land deal falls through, and we don't need to get into all the details of why it falls through. There are going to be lawsuits. Patrick Henry and his partners bring lawsuits against Georgia, saying that Georgia reneged on the contract. Um, but the key thing is that deal falls through. Well, since that land didn't sell to this consortium, Georgia sells that land to a different group. And in the second sale, uh, as it turns out, virtually every member of the Georgia legislature was bribed. This becomes the great Yazoo land fraud. It's a case that goes on for many years. It ends up at the Supreme Court. And it was clearly a fraudulent transaction in which these land speculators are bribing the members of the Georgia legislature. But it's completely different and unrelated to Patrick Henry's effort to buy the Yazoo lands. It was a different period. And as I said, in history, including uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, recollection of some of the Yazoo land controversies, these two are confused. And Henry uh, never really, uh, he, he, there's no real serious accusation that he ever uses his government position or engages in bribery uh, or inappropriate activity to try to um, aggrandize his own wealth. Um, so he doesn't get the Yazoo lands, but he's not a part of the Yazoo land frauds.